Hello and welcome back to our continuing webinar series on creating videos with your HDSLR. For those of you just joining us, this series is dedicated to teaching you about the tools and techniques needed to turn your photographic knowledge into filmmaking prowess. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, make sure you check them out by going to Cinevate.com. Just click on the webinars link on the right hand side of the page. Now before we begin, I'd like to take a quick second to thank Cinevate for sponsoring today's webinar, as well as Triple Scoop Music for providing us with the opening theme for today's episode. Today, we will investigate some basic filmmaking concepts and delve into the technique behind the art of filmmaking. We'll talk about concepts like the 180 degree rule and see how these simple ideas can impact your film for the better. By the end of today's session, you will completely understand a handful of crucial filmmaking concepts and how they can be used to increase the quality of your HDSLR video productions, regardless of the content you're capturing. And so, without further ado, let's talk about our first concept, the establishing shot. Establishing shots typically set up scenes by showing the relationship between characters, objects, and their environment. This is a great place to start because we often forget to inform our viewers about the time, location, and state of our characters. Now, as a point of clarification, when I say characters, I'm really just referring to anyone or anything we're filming. Remember, we're creating stories, so a character could be a bride, a corporate executive, or even a deck of cards. If it's central to the story you're trying to tell, it's a character. One of my goals as a filmmaker here is to inform you about the time, location, and state of the characters in the scene. An establishing shot or series of establishing shots is a very simple way to achieve this because it can add context and give the viewer a better idea of what's going on. Just remember, who, what, where, and when, and you'll be on the right track towards having an effective establishing shot. Typically. Establishing shots are accomplished with wide to medium wide framing because it allows filmmakers an ability to capture more content in the frame. With a wide angle shot, I can usually add parts of the scene, my characters, and any identifying landmarks to help tie things together conceptually. In an establishing shot, you should always be able to tell the time of day, the general location of the characters, and the state that they're in. If one or all of those things are not clear to you, then you'll need to rethink the shot or add other material to the edit to help clarify things a little bit more. In the end, it's probably easiest to remember establishing shots tell our viewers about what's going to happen or what has happened. It's a pretty simple concept if you think about it, and it can be very effective if you expand on it by adding other establishing shots into the mix. As a filmmaker, picking a tripod, monopod, a handheld rig or a slider can be a real asset in trying to convey things to our viewers. So take a second and think about what you want your viewers to feel before you pick a tool. In the end, picking the right tool can be the difference between having good video and having great video. As we try to move our films along and better establish our scenes, having ways to introduce other characters or objects is really important. A great concept that can help us do this in our films is something called an eyeline match which is based off the premise that the viewer will want to see what the character on screen is seeing. The eyeline match starts with a character looking at something off screen, and it is immediately followed by a cut to an object or person that they're looking at. Now, practically speaking, an eyeline match can take the place of a pan to help condense action on screen significantly. However, I should definitely point out that it doesn't take the place of a pan. It's just another technique that we can use to enhance our video. As we move from understanding how to establish scenes with an establishing shot, and how to enhance them with tools and other techniques, this is a great time to explore something called the 180 degree rule. For those of you new to this concept, the 180 degree rule is a fundamental concept in filmmaking that helps create the visual relationship between two characters or objects on screen. Regardless of the content you're capturing, it's crucial to understand what the 180 degree rule is and how it's established. So whereas the establishing shot provides the context of the time, location, and state of our characters, the 180 degree rule establishes the relationship of our characters to each other. So how do you do it? It's simple. Grab two people and point the camera at them. When two characters are on screen, simply pointing the camera at them establishes the 180 degree rule because you've introduced the viewer to the subjects. In other words, 
you visually establish them in the scene. In a simple composition, a typical technique filmmakers use here is something called a shot reverse shot, which involves cutting from the person on the right to the person on the left. Now, it's a great way to show interaction between two people, but we can really confuse our viewers if we don't adhere to the 180 degree rule. Now, in this situation, there's one person on the right and the other person on the left. Now, let's pretend that an invisible barrier connects these two individuals, forcing us to stay on the side closest to the camera. If we capture everything on this side of the barrier for every shot in the scene, then we've basically adhered to the 180 degree rule because the subjects are where they're supposed to be. In other words, the person on the right stays on the right, and the person on the left stays on the left. However, if we were to cross the invisible barrier, or the axis as it's really known, and jump the line between the two individuals, the resulting footage appears disconnected when it's edited together because the subjects don't end up where they should be in our minds. In fact, they end up on the side opposite of where they're supposed to be. This can be really confusing and disorienting to anyone watching your video. Ultimately, adhering to the 180 degree rule will help us naturally build continuity and fluidity into any video project. So the next natural question is, are we allowed to break this rule? And if so, when are we allowed to do it? The answer is simple. So long as you re-establish the 180 degree rule within a scene, you can jump the line at any time. By showing the complete movement from one side of the axis to the other side, within the scene, and using the complete take in your final edit, you will have effectively jumped the line and re-established the 180 degree rule. One thing to remember is, when you move the viewer to a new location, you must continue filming the scene entirely on the near side of the axis because you've re-established the 180 degree rule. Using different tools can do a lot for your footage when you seek to re-establish and establish the 180 degree rule. For example, the footage created from a handheld rig will differ significantly from the footage created by a slider. Now, it's not a matter of what's good or bad here. Instead, it's about what I've always said picking the right tool to tell your story. As you pick tools to establish and re-establish the 180 degree rule, it's really important to remember that the viewer is an active participant when they're watching your film. So picking the right tool to convey the perfect feeling is a very effective way of captivating your audience as you tell your story. Now that we've talked about the 180 degree rule, the next natural thing to talk about is the 30 degree rule because it gives us an idea of where we should move our cameras between cuts. The 30 degree rule is another fundamental concept within filmmaking that is best understood in relation to something called a jump cut. Contrary to popular belief, a jump cut is not a cut between two subjects, but instead a cut between two shots that's captured less than 30 degrees apart. As you can see from these examples, not moving the camera enough between shots can result in a very jarring experience for the viewer. To avoid the unpleasant sensation of a jump cut, it's imperative to move the camera far enough away from its previous shot. This will ultimately help us create more fluid edits because the footage will piece together more easily and not jar the viewer out of the experience. Ultimately, if we base our camera movements off the 30 degree rule, we can change our camera position and even vary our focal length as much as we want. For the last sequence, I used a variety of different tools because it gave me a lot of material to use in the editing room. Having the ability to jump from a monopod to a tripod and then to a slider made producing the content very easy. Using an HDSLR to create video is amazing because it's versatile and doesn't take up a lot of time to set up between shots. Using the right tools leverage the mobility of an HDSLR and make it an even better filmmaking tool. Sometimes, it can be very effective in a film to establish action that is occurring at the same time. For example, if you're covering an event like a wedding, and one camera operator is with the men, and the other camera operator is with the women, employing a technique called a crosscut can be very effective because it will give your viewers a better understanding of what's going on in your film. It just takes a bit of planning to do properly. In a crosscut, the camera will cut away from one action to a completely different action to convey that they're both happening simultaneously. 
Sometimes, filmmakers even find a way to eventually link the two actions to reinforce this message. A crosscut is also usually dressed up with other types of footage called inserts and cutaways. But before we talk about those, let's take a basic look at a crosscut. In this scene, I want to show that Brian is making his way through the house while Marlena is reading. So the best way to do this is to capture footage of Marlena and combine it with the footage of Brian moving through the house. It's a simple enough concept, but if I don't plan for it, I can't do it. The crosscut is very easy to do, but it requires a lot of different shots to do effectively. So this is another situation where picking the right tools and adhering to the rules we discussed earlier really pay off. In our cross-cutting example, I basically used two establishing shots edited together to convey to the viewer that there were things happening at the same time. I also went that extra step and linked the two actions by adding the shot of Brian walking into the room. This informs the viewer that the entire sequence was connected. If I want to enhance a crosscut even more, I can add inserts into it to help create more context to my footage. An insert is footage that can be used in a crosscut or with any other type of cut to help emphasize an action already covered in an establishing or master shot. This is usually done through the use of different framing or changes in focal length. For example, I can use a collection of footage to emphasize what one character is doing. In the end, using inserts helps us keep our viewers interested because we're able to give them something else to look at that pertains to the scene. Another type of shot that we could capture to add into a sequence like this is something called a cutaway. Unlike an insert, a cutaway is a piece of footage that covers action not covered in the master shot. Basically, cutaways interrupt a continuous action with views of something else. They can be pretty much anywhere in a film because they don't have to contribute any dramatic content of their own. They're just used to enhance or add context to what's happening on screen. For example, if my main shot is of an individual walking down the street, possible cutaways could include a shot of sprinklers going off or a shot of a person from a window watching overhead. The important thing here is that the shots do not directly relate to the action, but instead are something ancillary to it. As we explore some other fundamental techniques that we can use in our filmmaking, the L-cut is a way to add a lot of impact to what we're showing our viewers. Conceptually, an L-cut is a transitional cut that synchronizes the footage of one take with the sound of another take. This cut is typically used to bring together two shots from the same scene in a more fluid and unobtrusive way. This helps us avoid repetitive back and forth cuts that can make it feel like a tennis match between two people. I know this sounds really complicated, but I promise you, it'll all make sense in the next few minutes. So let's take a look at a clip that doesn't use L cuts so we all get on the same page. No. Come on. No. Please. No. Just one game. Fine. In the previous clip, could you see how after a while it felt like a tennis match between the people speaking on screen? It actually got a little distracting, didn't it? That's because we could predict when the next cut was coming. When a viewer can predict a cut, it takes them out of the experience of watching your film, which is the last thing you want to happen. However, when you execute an L cut correctly, it not only immerses your viewer into what's happening, it also reduces the predictability of the cuts. Hopefully, this makes a little more sense after watching this. No. Come on. No. Please. No. Just one game. Fine. Didn't that feel a little better? What do you think? Ultimately, the central purpose of an L cut is to show the reaction of the other person in the scene. Half the story of the scene is how Marlena reacts to what Brian is doing. That's the most, if not all, of the fun in the scene. So take a look at how the scene feels when we don't cut to Marlena. That felt a little incomplete, didn't it? Not using an L-cut here would be a mistake because it's preventing our viewers from enjoying the full experience of what's going on. Now let's take a look at what the scene would look like when we add an L-cut. <laughs> 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 
My last point about L cuts revolves around the equipment we use to set up our shots. Just like every other situation, picking the right tool can really enhance what's going on in the scene. What kind of tool would you have picked to show what we showed? Why? Would have been a monopod? A slider? A tripod? As you're hopefully starting to see, having access to tools is an important part of filmmaking because it helps us more easily tell our stories. I really encourage you to try different tools as you create your films. It's an important part of the process, and it will really help you understand how certain tools work in specific situations. Well, that's all we had for today. I hope you had as much fun learning as I did teaching. My hope is that we continue to offer you high quality education that's easy to understand. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.